Okay, I'll just get it. Do you mind if this is just right? Okay. Good I'm just referring to our content. <laughs> I'm Jan Moore, so and I'd like, like to thank you all for joining <laughs> us today for our panel, Elements of an Artist's <coughs> Following <coughs> the question of the next painting, the next installation, the next video, is the ever-present question of where will the work be shown? How will it be received? What attention will it capture? These may be the only fleeting questions while the studio work is in progress. But what follows, not as a question, but rather as a hope, a wish, an unvoiced weight on the heart, what will become of the work? Artists spend a lifetime in the studio questioning the mark, the color, the surface, the light. It is not until that lifetime in the studio draws to a late close that the ultimate question enters the studio, what happens after the system shuts down? In fact, it is so cold in the assertion of the fact that the artist's life ends that the artist often never examines the question, much less attempts to address it with a concrete response. What is an artist's legacy? Is it a body of work to be preserved, intact, or elements to be distributed widely? Is it an educational vision to be shared with an institution and future artists through a scholarship fund? Is it a deep connection to nature to be conserved through a residency program? Is it a commitment to social practice that includes community organizations or health centers or libraries or animal rescue? Does the artist have heirs who hold the same vision or who see a way to implement the artist's vision? And when the estate of the artist has no champion with the expertise to implement these plans, what alternatives exist? Mm. What options might be put in place to realize the vision of that legacy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is an artist's legacy? In this panel, we wish to pose this question out loud in the presence of artists and historians, and we wish to poke and prod and unpack even the parts of the question which may prove uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It is our hope that in looking at this question, we may find some answers, and hopefully, we will be able to present some possible paths for securing the legacy of an artist willing to plan and pursue the elements of that future. It is my honor to be able to work with my co-chair, Sharon Loudon, artist, educator, and editor of the book series including Living and Sustaining a Creative Life, the artist as culture producer, and the forthcoming Last Artist Standing. Our first panelist, Terry Cohn, is an art historian, educator, critic, curator, and art appraiser. The editor of Pairing of Polarities, The Life and Art of Sonia Rappaport, Terry Cohn has worked both with the artist and, since her passing, with the artist's estate. Daisy Marie Holman, head of archives of the Richard Diebenkorn Foundation, is the daughter of the late painter Elizabeth Murray. Daisy Murray Holman has had a seat on both sides of the aisle. The professional and the personal, the public and the private. Then we look to Sweet Carnwath. To complete our panel as an artist, Carnwath logged a visionary path years ago when, together with artist Viola Fry and historic preservation planner Gary Knecht, she co-founded the Artist Legacy Foundation. An educator and mentor to younger artists, Sweet Carnwath is a model for honoring art and supporting artists through exposure and philanthropy. Um, we will just have all our panelists come up in turn and please welcome them all. Everybody 
videos told me when you when you start a talk, you have to make somebody laugh or give them an image that they won't forget. So I chose Roz Chast, and I liked her memorial here to uh, to um, the woman who is who does it all. And it's interesting to think about relative to um, to artist legacies. And I'm talking about a woman artist, which is <coughs> Sonia Legacy. <Leggett>, Sonia <laughs> so like her wrap up work. Anyway, um, so. The title of my paper is Building Artist, Artist Legacies. It's all about the relationships. Um, and uh, I, this is just a photograph of um, the three people um, from your left, um, Carly Guasta, Ala Ufimova, and myself. Um, and then on my right is uh, Leah Levy, um, who is the director of the Jada Feo Trust. And we all were participating in a talk at the San Francisco Art Institute as I took this picture. So I just I liked it, so I thought it would put it there. Because we are all doing similar work. Um, and it's a pleasure to um, introduce this work I've been doing since the early 2000s, working with artists at different career stages. Um, it really grew out of my career as a curator, as a writer, and as an art historian and a uh, particular focus on art since um, the mid 20th century. I've always um, enjoyed most working with living artists and my background as an art historian has made it relatively easy to contextualize artist work relative to the art historical canon. Sonia Rappaport came into my life um, in the early 2000s um, and I, I was actually um, introduced to her by uh, my colleague Meredith Trombull Sonia was looking for somebody, oh, this is the wrong slide. Okay. Um, and this is actually the, the image that was used for um, Sonia's obituary, and I really like it. She kind of, I don't know, I think she looks pretty hip for a 91-year-old. Um, anyway, she was looking for someone to work with her on curatorial tasks, finding exhibition opportunities, writings about her work, um, greater visibility in general, and also potentially a book about her life and her art. And like many uh, mature artists, her interest and focus was on being in her studio, making her work, and um, exhibitions. And legacy was not really in her foremost in her mind, but it was in there somehow, because at the point that I started working with her, she was already past 80. So a bit of background about her. Um, and I'm, I'm focusing on Sonia today because she is the most extensive work I've done with a single artist. Um, I am involved in other legacy work with other artists, but she's, she's the case study for today. Um, this is Sonia in the 1940s, um, probably late 40s, working on her master's degree at UC Berkeley. Um, one of her claims to fame is um, Jay DeFeo was a classmate of hers. Um, Jay was a, a year younger, they weren't particularly friends. Sonia was a little different. She was not nearly as um, out there as, uh, she had a, you know, a husband who was a um, a tenure professor at UC Berkeley, and she had kids, so it was a different different time in Sonia's life. Um, and here she is in her studio. She was an abstract expressionist painter with one of her children. This was in the 1950s to 60s. Um, she was juggling her life as an artist, was an, as a mother and as an artist, which is something that artists have always done, and she was no exception. Um, in 1963, she had her mid-career uh, mid survey. She was uh, 40 years old at the California Palace of the Legion of Honor. I love the white gloves um, until she sort of brought the professor's wife into the museum. But anyway, I just, I've always kind of found this, this picture to be interesting. And it also was the end of her work as a painter. From there, she got involved um, with work that was more conceptual. Um, and um, she um, really wanted to work more mixed media and sort of move forward in, in her life. So this is from the late 60s. Um, it's a series of pattern paintings that she did. Um, she was using um, basically cheap fabric, fabrics that she got, and she would paint on top of them. She would do stencils on them, etc. And this was her really decisive break with um, established schools of art. And she was working with appropriated materials and um, was very interested in the funky aspect of, of these materials. And um, creating her own visual vocabulary using what she called her Pandora's box, and we'll see that in a little bit. 
1970, she purchased an architect's desk. Um, UC Berkeley gets rid of desks and that sort of thing. And so she purchased one and she opened it and lo and behold found this set of survey charts. So she thought they were really interesting and we started working on top of them, both interested in content but also just using this found material to work on top of. And so she did a, a series of um, mixed media, this is gouache and mixed media on the survey chart, um, and did a, a number of these during that period of time. And then, um, actually, I'm a little too far. In the, in the 1980s, she got involved with doing interactive installations, and um, in the 1990s, got involved with working on the web. So she continued to going to move forward in the kind of media she was using during this period of time. Um, so we come to the 10 years that I was working with Sonia. I started working with Sonia in around um, you know, 2004. And um, in thinking about the legacies, I just wanted to give you a little background. Now, what did, what did I do with her? Because I was not yet doing legacy work with her. It was just she wanted to, to you know, be more visible. So. We did two exhibitions. One of them was um, this one, Pairing of Polarities at Kala Art Institute in Berkeley, California in 2011. It was focused on um, some of her installation work and some of her computer drawings. This was co-curated with um, Anu Vikram. We did two exhibitions together, actually. This was the second, an image from the second one, um, which was called um, Spaces of Life at Mills College Art Museum the next year, 2012, um, and for this, for this show, um, it was it was the whole museum, and we uh, did a series of installations, and there were a number of performances that were related to it as well, um, focused on domestic themes. So the fact that she was a woman was not lost on her either, and sort of the ways in which she felt she had held herself back in her career. We did a book that year, so we, we started to accomplish the things that she wanted. Um, I have the book here, if anybody's interested later. Um, Pairing of Polarities, it was published by Haiti Books, which is not an art publisher, but nonetheless, it was a great opportunity. It's an anthology. I had um, 11 other writers, because Sonia had such a diverse career, it was valuable to um, have her, um, her work contextualized in the various ways that, um, you know, that she, in fact, did work. Um, this was a book release at Stanford that, that we did. Um, that's me with Sonia, obviously. Um, and then there were other projects that went between that period and when she passed away in 2015. In 2013, she had a one-person show at the Fresno Art Museum. So we all slept to Fresno, and um, she did some interactive <coughs> performance. We were giving a talk, um, and this show was focused on her pattern paintings and also her work with the New York Times. Uh, which I'll show you another image, which she worked with throughout her career and was always very interested in. And this lasted through to the end of her, her career. Um, let's see. Um, during this period of time, we also did um, you know, various other kinds of outreach. She was interested in exhibitions. She wanted to publish more. She contributed to a number of books. She published in the journal Leonardo. She was constantly doing things, publishing, being visible in ways that <clears throat> were good for her as an artist, but, you know, how do you take all of that and then create a legacy out of it later? So, um, here we, we, this is um, Sonia, sort of at the end of her life, this is the image that Farley got particularly fixated on because it's really what she looked like, not that fabulous image of her, sort of looking more like, I don't know, Louise Bourgeois or somebody, but nonetheless, um, this is how Sonia saw herself and um, sort of a little more like your down-to-earth artist, which she was in many ways, although also um, very intellectually engaged. So, once she passed away in 2015, um, we got hired right at the end of her life. She was diagnosed with, um, a, with cancer and died three months later. She pulled us together the minute she was diagnosed, Farley, Ali, Ifimaga, and myself. To, um, to be kind of this three-legged stool to manage her legacy. Farley's the director of the Sonia Rappaport Legacy Trust, and we advised the trust. Um, there was some money put in place by her family, important, we need money to do this work. And so we got started. The first thing we did was a show at Crow's Work Gallery, which actually had been in place. She was involved in, in creating this exhibition, um, and um, this is part of the piece 
Um, her last piece, Yes or No, uh, we, we applied for and got some money from the Jane Fayo Foundation to produce a catalog, which was great. And um, we also did some rebranding of her website at the time. We also did a series of studio visits. The family did not sell her fabulous, she had, she had her studio as part of her fabulous house. Um, so we did a series of studio visits over the next year. Um, created a Facebook page. There's a lot of interest that was being created. Um, you know, the trust created a Facebook page, which still exists. So just in case you wondered where she was, you can find her there. The trust does um, quarterly newsletters that go out with an email mail blast. And um, so then uh, in 2017, I and I published um, an interview that we did with each other, actually. We were going to write a piece about it. Performer was interested in her, but we decided to interview each other. So that was a way that we published something about her more recently. She's also got work right now in a show at the Berkeley Art Museum called Way Bay, sort of looking at the Bay Area artists of that generation. And um, on Saturday, I'm actually going tomorrow, so Saturday, she's part of this project at Minnesota Street Project in San Francisco, um, at, in, which is looking at women artists of the West. It's going to be a symposium. She's in a show at Roma Young Gallery. So it's been interesting to see how Sonia, who we had some, it was, I love Sonia, she was a really interesting artist and she was highly misunderstood and she got in her own way. It's interesting to say that once she was gone, we were able to do a lot of things because she wasn't going, yes, but, but let me do this part or I know these people. And so um, it was wonderful to have her when she was here, but we've been able to do a lot more for her since she has been gone, which is <coughs> it's kind of sad to say, but it is the truth. Um, and she's, we've been able to contextualize her, we've been able to place her work in nature, and things that she wanted. So it's kind of complex. I feel guilty saying it because we don't want the artist to go away, but it's interesting to see how her work has continued to be of interest, particularly to a younger generation of artists. But we also did this, pub, this little publication for that show coming up this weekend. Um, and this is her. Um, that box on the left is her Pandora's box, which she used throughout her career um, as, a, as stencils that she used to manipulate her various images, etc. Um, these young women, um, Majel Connery and Christina Dutton, um, are currently doing, they're musicians and, and um, dancers, and they're doing a, um, a movement piece using her installations as the foundation for this. They got separate funding to do this, so that's been really neat to bring a young generation into this mix. Um, and so those are the current projects. 